In our last video, we learned about a few different properties that made taking derivatives a lot more simple. Instead of having to use the difference quotient every single time we took a derivative, we used some of these properties to break them down into smaller, more manageable functions that I then had. For example, if I could break it down into a product, into a power function, I then had a shortcut that I could use, the power rule, to come up with that derivative a lot more quickly. Well, we're going to continue on in that idea and look at a little bit, uh, some more complex functions. So we're going to start with, what if we have two functions being multiplied together? Or the product of two functions. And I want to take the derivative of this. Okay. Well, Based off of our addition property from yesterday, we might be thinking, oh, well, maybe it's as simple as just taking the derivative of the first function, taking the derivative of the second function, and multiplying those together. Maybe that's what it is. Okay. Well, we can actually test this out real quickly with the function x times x. What happens when you take the derivative of x times x? Well, according to our proposed rule, right, according to this, the derivative of x is just 1, and the derivative of x is just 1. 1 times 1 is 1, and that's my derivative. My derivative is just 1. Well, careful, because what is x times x? x times x is x squared. And if we remember from yesterday, if we take the derivative of x squared, that's a power function. I should get 2x. Those are not the same. All right? In fact, if I were to be a little bit more uh, mathematical here, I really should use this symbol. Those are not equal. So this rule right here um, doesn't work. It's not valid. Okay. So instead, I have to figure out a different rule. Well, it turns out there is still oops, there is still a relatively simple rule for if I have two functions being multiplied together. Instead, you get this rule. Keep uh, <clears throat> actually no. Uh, let's see. Keep the first function. Multiply it by the derivative of the second function. And then you'll do the opposite. Take the derivative of the first function. Multiply it by the second function. Leave the second function how it is. And multiply it by the derivative of the first function. And then you'll add those two things together. So f of x times g prime of x plus f prime of x times g of x. This is what's called the product rule. It's used for whenever you are taking the derivative of the product of two functions. If you're curious about where this formula comes from, feel free to look it up. Feel free to look up proof of product rule um, online. And it's actually relatively simple to follow. And so I'd really encourage you if you're curious uh, because it might help you make more sense of this. Um, the same thing applies with some of the stuff we learned in the last video. If you're curious about where the power rule comes from, look it up. That's also a, a, a proof that is relatively simple to follow. And same thing with like the addition property. Look it up because uh, that one's also easy to follow if you want to know where the addition property comes from. Okay, but we don't have time in this video. Uh, product rule. So let's try this out with our super simple example. Let's see if it works this time. If I have x times x and I'm taking the derivative. Let's see what happens. According to the product rule, okay, I'm going to keep my first function, multiply it by the derivative of my second function. Well, derivative of x is just 1. And then I'm going to do the same thing, just opposite. Derivative of the first function is just 1 times my second function, x. Well, I get 1x plus 1x, which is 2x. And that matches. That's what we should be getting. Okay, very nice. So let's try a more complicated example. Okay, let's take the function h with input of z. So I, I changed up variables, but that doesn't affect anything. All the same, all the rules still apply. 
of 7 minus z squared z cubed times z cubed minus z plus 4. So I have two functions being multiplied together, which means, aha, I can use product rule. Uh, now, in order to use product rule, what's going to help is for me to recognize what my functions are. Okay, here's my f function, here's my g function. So here's my first function and the second function. The parentheses make it nice because uh, the parentheses help me see where it splits, what your first function is and what your second function is. Okay, and just to remind ourselves, product rule is f times g prime plus f prime times g. So what I'm going to need to do is I'm, I'm, I'm really going to need to find the derivatives of both of these pieces. So let's just focus on f for a second. What is the derivative of f? The, uh, once again, because it's polynomial, I can just look at each piece individually. Derivative of 7 is 0. Derivative of z squared is 2z. So my derivative of f is negative 2z. Okay, well, I have to do the same thing for g. What's g prime of z? What's my derivative of my second function? Well, once again, I can just use my power rule for each of the different terms. And I get 3z squared minus derivative of z is just 1. And the derivative of 4, since that's constant, is just 0. So I get 3z squared minus 1. Now that I know those, I can go ahead and use my product rule to finish this off. So, according to product rule, h prime of z is going to equal my f function, 7 minus z squared, times the derivative of my g function, so right here, 3z squared minus 1. Plus, now I'll switch them, derivative of my f function, negative 2z, times my g function, z cubed minus z plus 4. Okay. Now, now here's the deal. On your homework, uh, I'm going to give you a quick little tip. If you look at where you're supposed to submit your answer, and it does not say to simplify your answer, you can go ahead and submit it like this. Uh, and I and I would encourage you to go and do that because sometimes we make mistakes in simplifying. And then we can get the problem wrong, and it's not because we didn't do the derivative right. It's just because we simplified incorrectly. Okay, And so you can miss a whole lot of points, not based off of derivatives, but just based off of simplifying. So I would encourage you, as long as it, says, as long as it doesn't say you have to simplify, just plug in your answer like this. I'm going to simplify, though, because I want to compare it to how we would have done it if we didn't know product rule. Okay, So let's go ahead and simplify this and see what we get. Okay. If I simplify this, let's see, I get negative 2z to the fourth um, plus 2z squared minus 8z um, minus 3z to the fourth. Actually, sorry, I'm doing this in the wrong order. I mixed up my notes here. So I get negative 3z to the fourth plus um, what is that? 22z squared minus 7. Okay. And then I also get minus 2z to the fourth plus 2z squared minus 8z. Okay. Um, I can go ahead and combine like terms, and I get negative 5z to the fourth plus 24z squared minus 8z minus 7. Okay, so that's what I get when I actually simplify it, because uh, this is just, this uh, this piece is just this foiled out, and this piece is just this foiled out. Now, I can double check my work if I wanted to, by looking at how would we have done this if I didn't have product rule. Since these are polynomials, I can actually just FOIL this right now. I can expand this out by using the distributive property, and I get 
negative z to the fifth plus 8z cubed minus 4z squared minus 7z plus 28. Now that I just have a polynomial with no multiplication happening, besides just constant multiplication, I can now find this derivative. And when I find the derivative, I get negative 5z to the fourth plus 24z squared. This is just using the power rule, um, minus 8z minus 7. And the derivative of 28, of course, is just 0. So I'm done. And take a look at that. Eraser, they match. We got the same thing. Okay. So I'll leave it up to you to decide uh, which one's easier. Okay. Uh, because as long as we're working with polynomials like this, we have both uh, both of these methods as options of how to actually solve it. You can use the product rule. Okay. That's this method. Or you can expand the polynomial first, right? Using the distributive property, and that's this method. Either one works, and you can actually do both to check your answer if you'd like to, okay? And there might be some homework problems where it wants you to do both to just double check you're getting the same thing, okay? Well, that takes care if I'm multiplying functions together, but what if I'm dividing functions? What if I have a function divided by another function? Okay, and I wanted to take the derivative. Well, turns out there's a, there's a rule that I can use for this as well. Um, take a guess. Is it going to be as simple as just taking the derivative of f, taking the derivative of g, and dividing them? Sorry, it's not that simple. Okay. Instead, I get this formula, g of x times f prime of x minus, uh, let's see, g prime of x times f of x all over g of x squared. So let me explain what's going on. So you'll notice the top looks pretty similar to the product rule, except instead of addition, we have subtraction. But it's the same idea, right? You keep one, take the derivative of the other, and then do the opposite on the other side, but now I'm subtracting. This means that for the quotient rule, order matters. With the product rule, the order actually didn't matter because with addition, you can switch the order as much as you want. But with, product, with the quotient rule, the order matters. Now, to be clear, you're gonna have, uh, this is on your formula sheet, so you don't need to memorize this, but, but just please be careful when you're using it to make sure you've got the order right, okay? And then I'm dividing by my original g function squared, okay? So if I were to run through a really quick example, once again, if you're curious about how the, where this formula comes from, look up the proof online. And if you have trouble making sense of it, feel free to ask me any questions that you have. Okay, but let's look at a really simple example of this. Let's say I've got x plus 1 over 2x. Let's say that's my function. And, so, and actually, let me, just to, just to make sure that we're not getting too confused, let's go ahead and call this h of x. Okay? Well, once again, I need to make sure and recognize what my f and my g are. My f is the top function. My g is the bottom function. And with quotient rule, I'm going to be doing g times f prime minus g prime f over g squared. So that means I'm going to need to figure out if f of x is x plus 1, what's f prime of x? Well, in this case, f prime of x is just 1, right? Derivative of x is 1, derivative of 1 is 0, okay? But I'm going to have to do the same thing for g. g of x is equal to 2x, so g prime of x is equal to 2. The derivative of 2x is just 2. And so now I can put it all together using my quotient rule. And I get, let's see, 
2x, g of x, times f prime, which is just 1, minus g prime, which is 2, times f of x, which is x plus 1, all over 2x squared. Careful, because don't just write 2x and squared. You need parentheses to show that that squared affects the whole function. It affects all of g of x. Okay. Once again, same thing. If your homework doesn't tell you to simplify, just leave it like this. Um, and that's just to avoid any mistakes that might happen with simplifying. Uh, I'll go ahead and simplify, though, um, just to make this look a little cleaner. So I get 2x minus 2x minus 1 over 4x squared. Of course, the 2x's are going to cancel out, and I'm left with negative 1 over 4x squared. Awesome. Let's look at a more complicated example and an applied example. We haven't actually talked about any applied examples yet, okay? Uh, well, by the way, this, this could be a good place to pause and do a few of the quotient rule problems, try a few of them out. Uh, you could have also paused earlier in the video to try out some of the product rule problems, okay? Um, and then once you're ready, go ahead and press play again and we'll go through an applied example here. So, um, consider this function c of x equals 768 plus 12x minus 0 0.075x squared. This function is a cost function, which means that for a specific business that creates a product, this, this function will give them the total cost for producing X products. So X represents the number of products you're going to produce. And then this function will give you the, the total cost that, that's, that's, that's going to happen. Well, it turns out that if you have a cost function, you can find the average cost function relatively simple. Simply. Okay? It turns out that average cost Sorry, I should actually, I should write out average just to, is equal to C of X, your cost function, divided by X. Okay. And this is also true for if you have a revenue function. Okay. A revenue function would be how much total money do you, do you uh, earn or do you bring in if you produce this number of products. Okay. Uh, you can find average revenue by just taking your revenue function and dividing by x. This is true of profit. Okay, so if I kept going, you could find average revenue by just doing revenue function over x. And then same thing with your average profit. Profit, of course, is, um, I'll write this down here, profit is revenue minus cost, okay? You can find your average profit by taking your profit function and dividing by x. But what do I mean by average cost? Well, that means average cost, since this your original C function represents the total cost for producing x number of products, the average cost will give you how much does each product cost if you produce 30 products, or if you produce this X amount of products, how much does each product cost to produce? So this is your total cost, and then your average cost is on an individual scale. How much is it costing you to produce each product? So that's why this average cost becomes helpful. Well, what if we wanted to figure out the derivative of the average cost? Okay. How, and remember, derivative is an instantaneous rate of change. So what that would represent is how is your average cost changing? How is your average cost changing? So um, what is d over dx of my average cost? Well, guess what we're going to use? Quotient rule, right? Because what is this? If I were to actually write this out, 
This is 768 plus 12x minus 0.075x squared all over x. I have a function over a function. So this is quotient rule. Okay, so let's put in the work. Let's figure out what my f and g are. Okay, f is my top function. G is my bottom function. Let's find their derivatives. So let's see, f of x equals 768 plus 12x minus 0.075x squared. That means my derivative, the derivative of 768, since that's constant, the derivative is just 0. The derivative of 12x is just 12. And then the derivative of negative 0.075x squared, I can use the power rule, 0 0.075 times 2 is um, 0.15x, because I decreased the power by 1. Uh, very nice. Next, I need to do the same thing for my bottom function. My bottom function is much simpler, so g of x is just equal to x. Oh, goodness. Which means my derivative is just 1. Okay. So now that I have that. Oopsies. I can use the quotient URL. I am ready to use the quotient rule on my average cost function. Okay. So let's see what happens. Okay, according to the quotient rule, I'm going to do g of x, uh, which is x times f prime of x, right? I'm just referring back up to here, f prime of x. So 12 minus 0.15x minus uh, g prime of x, which is just 1 times f of x times 768 plus 12x minus 0.075x squared all over my g of x squared. Very nice. Okay. Okay, so now I can simplify. Oopsies. Now I can simplify, I get 12x minus 0.15x squared minus 768 minus 12x uh, plus 0.075x squared. With a little simplification, you'll see that these 12x's cancel out because you have 12x minus 12x. I can combine some like terms and I get um, negative 0.075x squared minus 768 all over x squared. Very nice. I could rewrite this. I could rewrite this even more just by recognizing that um, I can divide, since I'm dividing this whole function by x squared, I can divide each of those terms by x squared. And I get negative, oh, sorry, I get negative 0 0.075 minus 768 over x squared. Very nice. So that represents the derivative of my average cost equation. So let's go ahead and plug a number in and see what that actually means. Let's look at what if x is equal to 256? Well, first of all, what does that mean? Remember, x represents the number of products. So if I set x to equal 256, that means I'm going to produce 256 products. Okay. Well, let's plug that in and see what we get. So negative 0.075 minus 768 over 256 squared. Well, I end up getting, this ends up equaling, negative 0 0.0867. What does that mean? What does that mean? Remember, we just found the derivative of the average cost, which means we found how is the average cost changing. So 
if I produce 250 belts, then the price per belt is decreasing by about nine cents. Okay, nine cents is just me rounding to the nearest cent here. So, uh, so the price per belt, let me actually write this out. The price per belt, oopsies. Oh my goodness, is decreasing by about nine cents. Right here, I'll actually write out cents. By approximately nine cents. Okay. Price per belt? Once again, the reason why it's price per belt is because we're looking at average cost. Okay, we're not looking at total cost, we're looking at how much does it cost to produce each belt. So the price per belt is decreasing by about nine cents. Um, um, and then once again, I guess I need to specify when I produce 256 belts. Okay. So if I produce more belts, my price per belt is going to go down, right? It's going to be cheaper to produce each belt. If I produce less belts, then it's going to cost me more to produce each belt. Okay. Good luck on the homework. Let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you in the next video.